Did you know that prior to 1848, most of Western United States belonged to Mexico? In today's video, we will discuss how land from Texas to California ended up becoming part of the United States. In 1836, Texas had just gained its independence from Mexico. After a near 10-year struggle to remain independent, the Republic of Texas would become the 28th state to join the Union in 1845. This would bring border disputes between Mexico and the United States. The main dispute was the size of Texas. Mexico claimed that Texas ended at the Nueces River, while the United States claimed it ended at the Rio Grande. Shortly after the U.S. annexation of Texas, Mexico's political relations with the U.S. were at a low-time low. U.S. President at the time, James K. Polk, wanted to negotiate the disputed Texas border and purchase New Mexico and California for $30 million in late 1845. The Mexican government would come nowhere close to considering the offer. In fact, they had prior knowledge about the negotiator Polk had sent down to Mexico City, and the Mexican president at the time, José Joaquín Herrera, refused to receive him. The Mexican government saw this deal as a way of dismembering the country by the U.S. government. This would prompt Polk to place troops in the disputed area between the Nueces and Rio Grande rivers in January of 1846. Hostilities would surge between Mexican and U.S. troops in the disputed land, and in May of 1846, Polk began to prepare a war message to Congress. In it, Polk justified hostilities on the grounds of Mexican refusal to pay U.S. claims and their refusal to negotiate. That same evening, Polk received reports of a skirmish in late April in which Mexican troops crossed the Rio Grande and killed or injured 16 American troops. In his revised message to Congress, Polk claimed that Mexico had, quote, invaded our territory and shed American blood on American soil. And on May 13, 1846, Congress overwhelmingly approved the declaration of war, bringing the official start to the Mexican-American War. Though Congress's approval was overwhelming, this is not to say that the U.S. went into war undivided, Democrats strongly favored the conflict, while others viewed Polk's decision as land-grabbing. There were challenges in both the Senate and the House in the trustworthiness of Polk's claim that the conflict between Mexican and U.S. troops actually happened on U.S. soil. The main issue was where the event actually took place, and some criticized Polk's own willingness to recognize the Nueces River as a border between both countries. Criticism over the claim and of the war itself continued well into the conflict, with the House voting to censure Polk for having, quote, unnecessarily and unconstitutionally initiated war with Mexico. When war broke out, former Mexican president and general Antonio López de Santana, who oversaw the Mexican loss of Texas territory and was exiled in Cuba at the time, contacted Polk for a way to reach peace in favor of the U.S. However, on his return to Mexico, Santana took charge of Mexican forces. Though the Mexican army was larger in numbers, they were ill-equipped and lacked training against their U.S. counterparts. In fact, famous Union general Ulysses S. Grant would later call the Mexican-American War, quote, one of the most unjust ever waged by a stronger nation against a weaker nation. Polk's plan for the war was to send troops across the Rio Grande into the heart of Mexico, under the command of General Zachary Taylor while Colonel Stephen Kearney was sent to occupy the territory in New Mexico and California. Kearney was faced with little resistance in the West, as it lacked population and there was a willingness to accept the U.S. occupation with minimum resentment. At the river, Zachary would face multiple battles with Mexican forces. U.S. forces would win a series of battles and Zachary would later take the city of Monterrey in September 1846. Though Zachary's forces were successful, he will not support a full-scale invasion of Mexico, with reports stating that he will not pursue fleeing Mexican forces. This prompted President Polk to change his vision on the war. He will take path through the sea and would order an army under the command of General Winfield Scott to take the port city of Veracruz and fight its way into Mexico City. By March of 1847, Scott and his troops had taken Veracruz and began fighting into Mexico City. Fighting continued through the following months. Though there was Mexican resistance, Scott's campaign was marked by a series of unbroken victories. And on September 14th, he would reach Mexico City after being victorious in the two-day battle of Chapultepec. This would bring an end to the military conflict side of the war. 
After the fighting came to an end, Polk was out to negotiate a peace treaty with Mexico. After months of negotiations, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed on February 2nd, 1848, bringing the official end to the Mexican-American War. The treaty will state that Mexico would cede nearly all territory in what is now the states of New Mexico, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, California, Texas, and Western Colorado for $15 million. At the end of the war, the United States would acquire more than 500,000 square miles of Mexican territory, drawing the new border between the countries at the Rio Grande. And that about sums up the end of the Mexican-American War. Now keep in mind that there are multiple battles that we did not get into. There are actually a lot of characters that we didn't go over as well. Keep in mind this is supposed to be just a brief summary of uh, the topic. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. If you want to learn more about other history topics in a simplistic manner, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out a lot. Uh, thank you very much for watching.